So welcome, Professor Ali uh, Abdul Rauf, um, and thank you for uh, accepting our invitation at the uh, Habitat Unit Chair of International uh, Urbanism and Design at Berlin Technical University uh, through our uh, course seminar, uh, Contemporary Arab Urbanism. And we uh, have here a group of students And we have also the rest online. And I'd like also to thank all the those uh, the audience who are joining us. We have like 18. Yeah, okay. So please, uh, Dr. Ali, you can share um, your screen. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Everybody can see the screen? Yes, yes, but you can still go to the uh, full screen. Please. Sure, sure. How about that? Yes, great. Awesome, awesome. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hassan, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, guten Abend for my friends, uh, the students around you. I am so grateful for the invitation coming from Professor Hagman and uh, Professor uh, Hassan. Uh, I am so excited and interested in the whole seminar. I mean, the notion of uh, contemporary Arab and Middle Eastern urbanism to be contested and tested and to create a dialogue around that, I think it's uh, fundamentally needed. And, and hence, I really appreciate the program and the initiative. And as you rightly said, uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, the Middle East also is extended, and hence it was an excellent idea from you and Professor uh, Hagman to have uh, kind of different lenses to use to look at what's happening in the different zones of the Middle East. And in my talk today, I will try to elaborate on the notion of uh, Gulf cities and how I see the impact of those cities in the Middle East. And particularly, I will shed light on the, the influence of Dubai. I want to also focus uh, so much on Doha because I, I, I work and live in Doha for the last uh, uh, 13, 14 years. Time is flying. And also, I want to shed some light on what's happening in, in Riyadh. So the context, I think it's kind of familiar for the students after all these wonderful lectures and, and talks. And, uh, you know, the Middle East extended all the way from Morocco uh, to Iraq and the Gulf. And particularly when we talk about the Gulf, we are focusing on what's called politically and economically the uh, Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, which is basically six countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Oman. Now, there are, in my opinion, two major perceptions, two major ideas constructed about what's happening in the Gulf and, and, and particularly the notion of the, the, the spectacle of the Gulf, the notion of the desert, the nomads, the camels. So I want to use my lecture to go beyond this myth because it's well constructed up even to this moment. I still meet people in my traveling and when I say I just came from Doha, Qatar, they would tell me stuff like, oh, but you're wearing normally. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, it's pretty interesting. And also, I want to go beyond the notion of, well, these guys, they have money. I mean, it's also one of the very strong, common, constructed perception. They have a lot of money. They sell oil. They drive Ferraris and Maseratis and Rolls Royce and, and so on and so forth. And I think particularly this perception was was structured in a lot of movies and a lot of uh, artwork that was suggesting that this is the essence of Gulf countries. But yet, if you look at the history of most of those cities, uh, number one, you will notice a couple of things depicted beautifully in this image. Number one, you see that there is a specific architecture 
and urban heritage, which is so much connected with the context and respecting the environment. And at the same time, you see on the right hand of the photo, a very interesting relation with the water, a very interesting relation with the Gulf, because as I would elaborate later, it was the backbone of their economy. And the same argument can be extended to the rest of Gulf cities, traditional Gulf cities. You can see that in Jeddah, in Manama, in Abu Harraq, in Dubai, and so on. This is Dubai in the 50s, as and you can see, very simple life, and I would say even it was very harsh life, because imagine all of these kind of struggles to maintain your life and to maintain um, the relation between people and families and communities in such very tough time. And then there was a fundamental crucial change resulted from the discovery of oil. And for Gulf cities, that was the fundamental transformation. And it was a fundamental transformation because instead of fishing and doing pearl diving, suddenly they have a lucrative revenues coming from say, selling oil. I love this image very much and I called it the icons of modernity. I mean, you see the Bedouin, you see the car, you see the pipe, the oil pipe, and you see the plane. And you imagine that all of this took place in a matter of months, right? So you can imagine the, the impact of such change in a, on a very uh, primitive societies. But not only the discovery of oil was a major change in terms of the economy and revenues, but also so much related to the notion of urbanity, the notion of creating settlements. So for the very first time in the history of Gulf cities, they were moving from the edges of the water because, as I explained, the, the economical relation was, was related to traveling for fishing and pearl diving to where are we having the oil wells? And therefore, here, for instance, this is an interesting photo that was taken in the 20s in, in Dahran city, which one of the major, uh, major cities in, in Saudi Arabia now. And this is how the city started with a very simple uh, early camp. If, if you are interested in novels and, and how creative writers have the ability to capture the essence of change, I would recommend for you Cities of Salt by Abdurrahman and Munayyaf. Uh, absolutely, absolutely a masterpiece. And, and, and he used his creative abilities in writing novels to show us the impact of such a very quick and speedy change that took place not only culturally but physically socially economically and so on another interesting novel i love novels very much i wrote a whole book about novels and architecture uh, but another novel that was not translated uh, but maybe Dr. Hassan later, I will send him a copy for you guys to elaborate on. Uh, but but this this novel was was written by a, a gentleman. His name is Hamoud Saiq, which is basically a fake name because the the the, the novel was uh, was uh, uh, abandoned from entering most of the Gulf cities, and it's called Tsunami, right? And you guys know Tsunami. So again, it's about change. But what was interesting in this novel is that from the very first couple of pages, Hamoud Asayek, the author, drew a very dramatic image in 2195. He is visualizing the Bangladeshi embassy in Riyadh with hundreds of Saudi people waiting in line to get a visa to travel to Bangladesh, to Dhaka, Bangladesh, to work as drivers. Now, this is very, very dramatic. And then later in the novel, he will elaborate on that, suggesting that this might happen. This might happen if we don't have oil anymore. So I would argue that this novel was a wonderful big red flag telling 
people in the Gulf, telling decision makers in the Gulf that the post oil paradigm is coming and you don't want to end up with your young people waiting in line to get a visa to travel to another country that you used to bring uh, uh, drivers and domestic uh, help and so on and so forth from to work as drivers. So yes, Gulf cities are in transition because they started to realize that post-carbon paradigm is coming. And particularly for our domain, architecture and urbanism, we need to question the notion also of post-oil city, how, how we can move to a more resilient, equitable, it's sustainable, and so on. And, and you know, it's not only about the, the, the depletion of oil or the, the, the prices, but it's also so much related to what's happening in the world in terms of renewable energies. And I think Germany and Berlin and, and, and every single city in Germany, and I've been to a lot of places in Germany, and I can, I can say clearly that you have a lot of examples in Germany suggesting that we are approaching the post-oil paradigm. Now, what was interesting in this photo is that this is the very first solar plane that took a trip around the world. The first uh, leg was from Abu Dhabi to Muscat in Oman. Two of them are Gulf cities. And the whole trip was done without using a single drop of oil. And ironically, as you can see in the picture, the, the plane was flying on top of all these glass skyscrapers that the oil money was used to do, and which is all of them without electricity, without oil, without air conditions, it will be really disastrous. So the notion of oil here, it's not only about the depletion of oil or the cheap prices, but also about relevance. Maybe we are approaching a new phase in the history of humankind where oil is not going to be that important. And hence, the whole economical structure, the whole economical matrix of the Middle East, of the Gulf would collapse. As Dr. Hassan said, I did plenty of research and writing about the Gulf. I have a total of 20 years of experience in the Gulf. And in, in my time depicting what is happening, I was able to see three main paradigms, which is very interesting if you look at three main paradigms in one decade. I mean, 10 years in the history of any city is nothing. But this is also very specific character, very specific trait about the, the jumping, the swift uh, uh, change in, in Gulf cities. And those three paradigms are basically, the first paradigm, I would call it Dubaiification. The second one is related to the green Russian sustainability. And the third one, which is I'm so excited about, the knowledgeification and the, the rise of knowledge economy and so on. So the first paradigm, as the title suggests, is so much related to the impact of Dubai and how Dubai became a model for development using iconic development and real estate fantasies and so on and so forth. Green rush and sustainability is related to sustainable movements and knowledge is related to the rise of knowledge economy and so on. So yes, Dubai did a great job in terms of convincing the Gulf that we have a new approach to urbanity, a new approach to development. And this approach was basically uh, a matter of we want the whole world to talk about us. We want to create a brand. We want to market the city. And how you can do that better than doing palms and doing the world map project. So all these projects that you can see on the top of the image are projects which I called it in my research, the real state fantasies, a project that would look like a, a palm only if you are flying on top of it. Or the world map is deconstructed into a number of islands and the top millionaires of the world can get an island which is representing part of the world and so on. 
and and literally that was also in the in the in the philosophy of the rulers this is sheikh muhammad the ruler of dubai and plenty plenty of uh, interviews he was even comparing dubai to a company and he was talking about how how we have to create this level of success and and bring people and create a brand and this brand should be used and how how to do whatever it takes to keep people talking about dubai and to be very honest with you the model was uh, duplicated in a lot of cities around the world the, the, the gulf in the lower part of my image, you see a comparison between Doha and Dubai. When Doha started to uh, uh, follow the steps of, of Dubai, particularly when it comes to uh, vertical development and, and, and real estate fantasies. And, and what was interesting also, that at that time, Dubai, one of its major slogans was built it and then they will come which is totally against the notion of sustainability, totally against the notion of who is your target group, what kind of community you are designing for, who are the people that you are conducting conversation with them to be able to create a good piece of architecture and urbanism. But that was not important because Dubai at that time, they have the financial resources and they want to build and they want to build skyscrapers, huge malls, huge entertainment parks, just to keep people talking about. They did. They did create a very interesting spectacle. These are some images from Sheikh Zayed Road, which one of the top locations for skyscrapers. I, I think it's one of the top locations all over the world, right? And you, 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 you know, of course, the, the, the Burj Khalifa and the rest of the very uh, interesting uh, skyscrapers. But what is interesting for us, because we are more excited about people. We are more excited about communities. So when you go down from the level of the spectacle to the level of the street, sometimes you are shocked with the quality of spaces, the quality of transportation, the traffic jams, and, 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 and the lack of spaces that would create intimate relation between the different community members. Another interesting impact of Dubai was what I, what I called it in some of my research also, the fallacy of regional urban competition, who will build more, bigger and higher. You see, in, uh, in this image, I don't know if you can see my pointer, those two towers, this is Burj Khalifa and this is a, a Kingdom Tower. And the Kingdom Tower was not built, but there's a wonderful story here. Uh, when they inaugurate uh, Burj, the original name was Burj Dubai, and then there was a financial crisis. I will talk about it in a minute. And uh, Dubai was on the verge of bankruptcy, so Abu Dhabi came and injected a lot of money. And uh, for that, to appreciate that, they changed the name of the Burj from Burj Dubai to Burj Khalifa. But during the opening, Prince Walid bin Talal in Saudi Arabia asked what this party, what's this huge party in, in our neighbor's backyard? And they said they opening a new tower called Burj Khalifa. And he asked, well, what's the height of this tower? And the answer was, that's 880 meters. He said, let's call our architectural urban consultants today because i cannot accept that the highest tower on earth is in dubai it should be in saudi arabia and therefore they decided to go for the kingdom tower which was one kilometer height one thousand meter again due to financial issues and maybe because of our luck it was not built another impact in my opinion, was the unprecedented rapid urbanization. And this is why when I talked in the beginning about the three paradigms in, in cities in the Gulf, I was basically considering the notion of the pace of development. These are two images of Sheikh Zayed in 2000 and after maybe 20 years. Uh, this is Doha in the 80s and this is Doha after again uh, 25 years or 30 years. Even around one of the 
most sacred places. And I also wrote a book about the urban development about uh, uh, Kaaba, Mecca, and, and again, uh, extensive uh, urbanization is happening. And this was extended even beyond the Gulf. And uh, I took this image uh, in, in, in Pakistan, uh, where the new candidates for the presidency in back in 2018, they were promoting that if I will be elected, I will transform Peshawar into a new Dubai. So Dubai was even used at the time. This is why I called it an urban brand. It was even used to promote uh, a, a political uh, presidency. And, and even in Cairo, Cairo, one of the most sophisticated cities in the world, one of the cities where you see uh, amazing layers of history and civilization, but they ended up with a vision called Dubai along the Nile, which is again showing us the impact of the Dubai model, the skyscrapers, the, the glass buildings, and so on and so forth. Now look at that. This is an image from a newspaper. I was reading a newspaper and in the very final page, the last page of the newspaper, I saw this ad. And the ad was titled, Dubai's history meets its future. So the black and, and white pictures are then, and the colored pictures are now. And quite honestly, I kept on looking at the two columns. And I felt that if you go through picture by picture from the lower part, you will see that in the old days, in the past, there was a harmonious relation between settlements and water because people, they know the importance of the Gulf for them. As when you go to the right hand side, we are doing reclamation on top of water. The, the column to the left, you see people celebrating that the fishermen are coming back while on the, on the right column, you see only a couple of chairs because, and then you go on the top, you see a, a guy doing sailing. And then on the top, there's a kid playing. You see the, the huge difference between community versus individuality. The difference between if you, it, it, all of us together versus only if you can afford. The difference between there's a sense of solidarity and sustainability versus consumption. So those also were, were, were very interesting comparisons to be conducted. And then the financial crisis hit Dubai big time, big time in 28 and 2009, uh, 2008 and 2009. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, I, I mean, I look, I look at an image like that, cartoon like that, and, and I, I am angry. I am angry because the same people that were telling Dubai, you are doing great. You are building wonderful city. This is a beautiful spectacle. People would come from all over the world. This is the real meaning of de development. The same consultants and the same advisors, they were making fun of what happened in Dubai. And you can see here, the whole city is decayed in the background and the Sheikh is sitting saying, well, they exaggerate a bit about the number of wives. And uh, then I have 26 wives and 58 kids to support and so on and so forth, right? Another interesting challenge is related to climate change. And as I said, all of the Gulf cities are so much portal cities. They are adjacent to water. And therefore, the whole idea of sea level rises is, is fundamentally important. Heat waves and how to deal with it is also important. Water and the availability of water. So plenty of existential issues that should be considered not only on a strategic and political level, but particularly from urban planning and architectural level. Some of the projects that were done in the Gulf suggesting that we are on the right track. This is a master project. And I wrote an article called Oasis or, or Mirage, uh, because this is a city that was delivered to us as the new utopia, the 20th century, the 21st century utopia. No, no, no energy consumption, 
no waste, no, no cars. And uh, we ended up with a, sp a specific institute designated for some research. And the project is totally isolated, fragmented, unfinished. So this is showing us a very interesting example about the difference between slogans for real estate versus authentic concepts that we believe in it as a community, as a political system, and so on. The third paradigm is the notion of knowledge purification, and, and particularly if you guys are not aware of the uh, the whole uh, philosophy of knowledge and creative economy, I, I, I just put here one of the interesting definitions, which in my opinion, very much related to uh, Gulf cities because of the fact that the stress here is not on having more, but on being more. I think this is so much related to my third slide, where I showed you that Gulf people, they have money, they have Ferraris, they have Rolls Royce, and that's it. No, the transformation now is that your contribution in the future of humanity is not that much related to how much money you have and to which extent you are consuming, but it's related to being more and how you use your brain and how you use your creative capabilities to contribute. Plenty of uh, wonderful writers talk about this. And uh, I, would, I would nominate for you a couple of books, The Rise of the Creative Class, uh, uh, by Richard Florida and in his second book also in the same direction, Who is Your City? Where he was talking about a new geography, new geography coming from the rise of the creative class. People who are, they don't have assets anymore except to their creative capabilities. And therefore, they're willing to cross the borders. They're willing to cross geographies, to go to any city that would nurture their creativity, that would allow them to practice. And therefore, the importance of place is becoming very essential element in the competition between different cities. Another wonderful, wonderful writer, scholar, I, I was just with him a month ago in, in Brussels. And he, he's, all the time, he's a wonderful person. But uh, particularly this time, we, we, we spent almost a week and we had a, a lot of discussions. He's full of energy. But you know what? He's talking about creativity all the time. So, of course, he's full of energy. But, but what was wonderful about Charles Landry, who, who wrote his classical book, The Creative City, which is for the very first time in our modern uh, literature about cities and urbanity and architecture, that a scholar would 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 tell us that let's focus on the question of can places stimulate us can places enhance our creativity can places inspire us can streets inspire us and so on and so forth and the accumulation of this resulted in a new domain of research and practice, knowledge-based urban development, which I, I think it's a new paradigm in planning and urbanism, and plenty, plenty of books and research and, and consultancies happening around the world. All of it is related to the place of knowledge and creativity in the competitiveness between cities. Museums are one of the one of the uh, manifestation of knowledge and creative economy, and you can see also a very interesting competition between uh, Gulf cities to hire uh, Norman Foster, Novell, Imperi, and so on and so forth to do different museums in the Gulf. This is the Saadiyat Island in 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 Abu Dhabi, where you have uh, 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 the Louvre and the Guggenheim Museum. I think it's. Uh, almost uh, in, in the construction phase. Zaha Hadid also, the project is coming back and so on. But again, when you zoom in, particularly in the case of, of, uh, of uh, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, despite the political uh, debate that, uh, that was, was really heated up in, in Paris regarding that we don't want to, do, to, to, to market our own identity by selling the Louvre. But despite that, 
one of the main conditions about knowledge cities and knowledge uh, and, and creative cities is that those centers of creativity and knowledge and culture should be integrated within the city. And I think although the museum is a wonderful piece of architecture, with, um, as you can see in the lower uh, pictures, beautiful tapestry of light and shade, but it's segregated, a segregated project, isolated and separated from, from the city. On top of that also, there is a lack of social justice because once the project is isolated and you need to pay to enter the place, then it is a bit not related to the whole community, but related to the rich and sophisticated and not to uh, every sector from the community. Interesting universities also are happening all over the place. This is King Abdullah Economic City and, and University for Science and Technology. Now, what is interesting in this project, in 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 addition to the fact that the, the project is focusing on being a, a, a knowledge cluster, focusing on innovations, creativity, and the new knowledge uh, um, uh, topics, but also they allowed women to drive in this campus. They, uh, they allowed women to be without hijab in this, in this campus, which at that time created also a very interesting conflict and a very interesting dichotomy and a discussion within the Saudi community, particularly between professors and students and what have you. Why you allow something to happen in a specific kind of place because now you're treated it as a sort of a gated community. And if you believe in those concepts, why don't you spread it all over the place? Now, the situation uh, is changing dramatically now in, in Saudi Arabia and uh, particularly when it comes to other issues that was uh, very crucial to the religious and the political system before, it's becoming very blurred now. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, and, and, and this is, I think, still very open question because it, I, I'm still writing something about that, but from a very hypothetical position. And I would argue that we are witnessing a very interesting shift now. I talked about Dubai and Dubai was the, the brand and it was a brand because of using all of these iconic developments and so on and so forth. I feel, I feel that we are witnessing a sort of a new transition from Dubaiification, Dubaization to Saudization. Because when I look at a project like the line, for instance, and, and you have a city extended throughout uh, 200 kilometer with maybe uh, a width of 500 meters and a, a height of uh, almost 200 meters, and, and you imagine what kind of vision that was uh, marketed for this place and how people would live here and uh, what kind of uh, 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 urban context that would be faced because of the mirror that is covering this, those 200 kilometers from the two sides. And you would question, I think you would feel that it is a legitimate question to say, is it really a sustainable project or it's a new addition towards branding Saudi Arabia, the Saudization process. And the same argument can go to a new project also in, in Saudi Arabia, in the heart of Riyadh, called the Murabba or the, the cube, right? And, and again, it's very mega structure. It's almost a half kilometer by half kilometer with the height of a half kilometer, huge, huge cube. And again, there are predicting that state of the art internal quality, uh, almost a space like kind of environment will be created there. And the question still legitimate. Is this what we are doing to cope with the post oil paradigm and the climate change and heat waves and so on and so forth? Or we are still in the process of making brands. Another very interesting question. If you look at the quality of uh, uh, architects and urbanists and, 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 and planners doing all of these projects, you will be amazed because you will, quest, you will also ask a very interesting question. Why these guys are not doing this in their own countries? 
why they are doing this only in Dubai, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and so on and so forth. Uh, for the sake of time, let me move now to Doha, and it's, uh, it, I will try to provide a, a sort of a critical narrative about the city. And I want to start with showing you how my mission is almost impossible uh, with all my due respect to Tom Cruise. Uh, because Doha in 1998 was selected by Lonely Planet, which is people like in my age from the older generation from you guys were not relying when we do traveling we were not relying on the internet at that time we were buying books and those books were coming from the lonely planet series absolutely amazing books and it would give you a beautiful idea about the city or country now lonely planet experts in 1998 they decided that doha is one of the most boring cities on earth Imagine that. So Doha, only 25 years ago, was considered one of the most boring cities on earth. And if I want to contextualize the city, very similar to what I talked about, this is Doha in the heart of the Gulf with the land uh, uh, borders with Saudi Arabia and the rest is a kind of peninsula, uh, finger-like within, within uh, the Arabian uh, slash Persian Gulf, if you like to. Uh, and as you can see in the image, very similar situation to what I described regarding the rest of the Gulf cities, very humble architecture, the only verticality is because of the minutes, and again, the very organic relation between the, the, the settlement and the water. Uh, this is Doha in 1937, the very humble fisherman settlement. And this is one of the images, one of the very early air, uh, uh, aerial images that was taken for Doha in 1947. Very tough life, very tough life. The, the, the only economy was based on fishing and pearl diving. And you cannot imagine, I mean, when the ships would come back to Doha, it was a ceremony. It was a communal ceremonial uh, kind of, 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 of occasion because sometimes more than half of the people will never come back due to a drowning or, or diseases or what have you. And also, if you zoom at the city, you will see, again, the very traditional kind of architecture, the courtyard houses, the small alley, the covered markets, different features that are echoed in most of the Middle, old uh, Middle Eastern and, 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 and Arab and Gulf cities. The transformation took place uh, during uh, 1939 when they discovered oil, but they started to ship oil in 1947. And this is very critical date because this is the very first time in the history of Qatar to start receiving regular income. This is very important. And hence, when you see the lower picture, you will start to see Again, icons of modernity, the paved roads, the cars, even change in the architectural language because of some institutional buildings like schools and health facilities and so on. And the unprecedented oil revenues also paved the way to an amazing pattern, not only in, in, in Doha, but as I said before, most of the Gulf cities. Those are maps that I prepared showing you the, 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 the frog jump the frog leap every 10 years every 10 years the city is expanded and as i put here in my slide a question mark regarding we have to pose and ask question are we developing in the right direction is this the future that we are looking for is this the pace is acceptable if you want to see exactly what I'm talking about here, uh, this is the traditional settlement that I showed you when I said this is Doha in 1937. So this is the origin of the genesis of Doha. And this square is here now, if you compare it to the rest of, of uh, uh, greater Doha. So incredible urban sprout, and, and, and this urban sprout resulted in a couple of things. Number one, urban fragmentation, 
Number two, car is the solution. You have to keep on driving all the time. These are images that de depicting the waterfront within 10 years. So the difference, the time difference between the four pictures is between two or three years. And you can see again, the huge pace of development, but also you can see that this is so much related to the paradigm that I talked about, the Dubaiification, the impact of Dubai. We need to build skyscrapers. We need to be similar to Dubai. The very first step in Qatar to hire a planning consultant to do a vision for the city, not the country, the only Doha, only Greater Doha, uh, uh, was done by uh, William Pierre and his major recommendation, because again, we were in the oil paradigm, we have a lot of money and so on and so forth. So his recommendation was, Doha is growing beautifully, but we need also new horizons for the for the for the uh, uh, development. So he suggested that more development should be done to the north part of the city and also to the depth of the of the island. And because of that, you can see again the pace of development. Uh, this is the Sheraton Hotel, was which was used to be the top the highest uh, uh, tower or, or building in, in, in Doha. It's a hotel and convention center. And, and this is the hotel now, if you compare it to the rest of the development, again, which emerged from the Dubaiification process. Yeah, this is a close up of what I'm talking about. And this is also very similar to what was happening in Dubai. This is a project called the Pearl. And, and again, the assumption is that if you fly on top of it, it would give you the sense of a shell. And in the heart of the shell, there is a pearl and so on and so forth. All these uh, formal metaphorics uh, uh, used to uh, interpret the morphology of projects and definitely the vertical development, as I said before. Now. <clears throat> There was a paradigm shift, and this paradigm shift is due to different kinds of reasons. Partially because of the financial crisis that I talked about, partially because of a new leadership in Doha, partially because of a new vision about what do we mean by development. So we started to say that let's go for an alternative. Doha is not Dubai. Building the highest tower, largest mall, or an artificial island is not the solution, right? And we started to sort of investigate this more, the challenge of branding Doha. Now, if you copy a global brand or global model, like what Dubai is doing, imitating Singapore and Shanghai and Chicago and so on and so forth, you don't have a value because you are a copier and you neglect your culture and you neglect your architecture and you neglect your, your urban history. And if you copy Dubai, you are copying the copy. So again, you are a loser because you are not really adding anything and you are not respecting what you have. So a lot of brains were, were, were gathered in, in, in think tanks, particularly in the domain of architecture and urbanism. It was done on, on different levels in Doha, but one of which was architecture and urbanism, to start to create a different model, to create different assets. And those assets are so much related to the notion of authentic identity. And by saying authentic identity here, I'm not talking about the history, I'm talking about nostalgia for the past, but I'm particularly talking about an identity within the, the, the notion of knowledge-based urban identity for Qatar. So doing that would, would require historical assets and heritage should be respected. The natural component and the environment should be protected. How to promote the ability of the city to host mega event, how the knowledge-based urban development would change the face of the city, urban diversity, the notion of urban tolerance and city for all, and the notion of integration versus segregation. So we don't want to end up with a fragmented metropolitan city. So connectivity is, is crucial 
key word here. We want to limit the urban sprawl because we know that if you keep on doing the urban sprawl, you cannot escape fragmentation. You cannot escape relying on cars. And we have, we have beautiful history in our uh, Middle Eastern cities and Gulf cities suggesting the importance of compacted cities. But also we have wonderful literature from abroad. I mean, Richard Rogers talked about this almost 40 or 50 years ago when he was talking about the notion of compacted nodes where living and working in leisure would be connected together. So this is a concept that is coming from our heritage and also substantiated by contemporary scholars. So that was one of the major changes to be done in the city, moving from a sprawling city to a multipolar centralized cities, meaning that you want to create independence, yet you have the overall tapestry of urbanity of Doha. Another important direction is how to convince the richest people on earth, Qataris, who are driving land cruisers, Maseratis, porches, and so on and so forth, to move towards public transportation. So transit-oriented development became fundamentally important in Qatar National Master Plan. We know that it would reduce traffic. We know it would reduce carbon footprint, promote healthy life, encourage walkability, and and, and social life and so on and so forth. But the challenge was, the main question was how to convince people to do that. And I will elaborate on that. One of the elaborations was based on the notion of the urban centers and how to divide now the city. The city now is not only metropolitan, fragmented, sprawled, but how to divide it into different urban centers and those urban centers, they have hierarchy from a capital city center all the way to a local center, but all of them are connected to public transportation, metros, buses, pedestrian routes, and so on. And here are the distribution. This is the vision of the new metropolitan Doha based on the availability of urban centers. Each of those urban centers, you have transportation node, mixed use development, green spaces, commercial activities, and so on. Another level was focusing on Doha town, downtown, the central part, and how to make the, to, to go towards the notion of connectivity, as I talked about it before. So you, number one, you know the different zones and you know the different characters of those zones, what's cultural, what's recreational, what's heritage, and so on. And then you create the connections, particularly by using green spaces and green streets and shaded areas, and also by public transportation. Another important transformation was based on how to transform Doha into a model for knowledge-based uh, urban development. So we became not that much excited about uh, having Burj Khalifa or Burj Dubai or the highest skyscraper on earth in Doha, but we were are more excited about museums, research centers, libraries, and so on. One of the top examples that m some of you might heard about it, edu Education City. Education City is a, a huge, huge project right in the heart of Doha, where you have top universities coming from different places in the world, Georgetown, Texas A&M, Virginia Commonwealth, and so on and so forth. And all of this is available to the, to the people, to the city, to the community, and to emphasize this more, some community facilities were added to allow people to come on a regular basis and not to, conf to, to, to transform the place into a gated community. So two main parks, Oxygen Park and Quranic Park are part of the project. The main library, and I will talk about it later, the main national library is also in the project. And one of the top a beautiful uh, city mosque is also there. So all of these activities and, uh, and definitely metro stations and so on. So all of this is again attracting people and preventing the project from being a, a gated community. And the architecture that was used in the project done by 
very good number of architects, but all of them, all of them received a very, very solid message. We need architecture that would stimulate the minds. We are not into functional buildings. Yes, educational buildings and student facilities are by no by notion very rigid, but we are we want a new architecture that would respect the environment and also would stimulate the minds of students and researchers and visitors and so on. This is the College of Islamic Studies and the mosque that I talked about uh, attached to it. And if you are familiar with the shapes of the mosque, you would realize that this is new in everything. It's questioning everything, questioning the notion of the minaret, questioning the notion of the of the dome, the notion of the relation between the form and the outdoor green spaces, the community park, and so on. So every single building almost every single piece of architecture is used as a platform as a manifestation of the notion of knowledge and creative uh, paradigm now all the gulf cities that i talked about when they have the oil boom and they have unprecedented financial resources all the local communities abandon the heart of their cities this is a pattern that took place in Kuwait, in Jeddah, in Doha, in Bahrain, you name it. And they moved to the suburbia because they wanna, they wanna live in villas. They don't wanna live in courtyard houses anymore, right? They wanna, actually, they wanna get rid of this chapter of their history. If you look at what happened in, in Kuwait, for instance, and in parts of Doha, they bulldozed, they literally bulldozed part of the cities because of one justification that these parts of the city are reminding us of poverty, are reminding us of the of the of the bad times. Although these are fundamental and crucial chapters in the narrative of the city. Now, one of the great projects that was done was how to do a holistic revitalization to this heart of the city. But when we do that, we want to do it knowing all the lessons that we have learned and also doing that in a more futuristic manner that would respect notions like walkability, the importance of public spaces, the importance of relying on renewable energies and so on. This is some of the diagrammatic sketches showing the, 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 the move in thinking, the conceptual move from scattered urbanity, where you have to use the car, as you can see in the left-hand side, versus the compacted urbanity, where it's more mixed used, integrated, where people can promote walkability and use of public transportation and the importance of public spaces and green areas and green corridors. Another interesting issue related to the language of architecture and how, how to look at your heritage, to understand it, to analyze it, to learn from it, to be inspired from it, but don't to copy it, not to copy it, not to imitate it uh, literally. And here you can see a lot of effort that was done to be inspired by the past and create something new for the future. That was exactly the exercise that most of the architects in Meshirab were subjected to. You, you learn about the context, you learn about the heritage, you learn about the vocabulary, but you have to come up with a new poem, with a new sentence, with a new melody. This is the, the project now, as you can see in the model, very similar to the urban fabric that I talked about in when Doha was a very uh, traditional settlement. Uh, some of the old projects that were preserved there to be transformed into different activities for youth and cultural places and schools and so on and so forth. So as if the project is, is a representation of cultural continuity also. It's not, it's not about our a contemporary moment, but you are connected to the past. And, and, and again, the importance of public spaces, particularly during the, the, the good weather time, you allow people from different nationalities and, and different backgrounds to interact and penetrate the place. It's not gated, it's not, uh, it's not excluded. 
I love this picture because it shows exactly what I'm talking about. That if you look at the foreground and the background, and, and the background is the outcome of this Dubaiification slash globalization slash what have you. But here, this is picture from Sherab towards the waterfront, and you can see the, the, the change and the transition and the transformation that I'm talking about. We're not excited about towers anymore, but we are excited about creating different quality of life. In 2010, there was another important transformation in Qatar. Qatar submitted a file to host the, the World FIFA Cup in 2022, and they won it. They won it. So in 2018, uh, there was a, another historical moment, which I called it passing the ball, and the Russian, they gave the ball to Qatar. Right. There was also a ceremony uh, suggesting that now the responsibility is in the hands of Qatar to do the, the, the FIFA 2022. Now, again, speaking of think tank and the importance of planning for the future, in 2010, Qatar won the bid. In 2018, the, the responsibility were fully transferred to Qatar. In 2022, Qatar was even two years before 2022, fully prepared for hosting the event. But the question was, and then what would happen after? The question of the future, the question of the impact of hosting such an event on the future of the city, the future of the country, the future of people living there. And hence, we started to create what we called it an alternative narrative a narrative that is based on the notion of how to use the, uh, the opportunity of hosting a, a, a global event as a catalyst for a better future. This is extremely important, particularly if you look at some other cases where we actually send the teams. I personally went to Moscow and I went to South Africa. Some colleagues went to Brazil. All of this because we want to test as a first-hand experience how the local community felt about hosting events. And we were so sad in situations like in South Africa or in Brazil, where people after the event felt that all their dreams were shattered and they were felt betrayed. I mean, I remember a discussion in, in, in South Africa where local community representatives told me we felt betrayed because we ended up with some hotels that we cannot afford even to walk by it, and the stadiums are becoming the drug dealers kind of headquarters and all the promises about prosperity and investment and working opportunities and employments and so on and so forth vanished. So the, the idea was how to subscribe to a new paradigm of cities or a new philosophy of cities hosting global events, which is based on the event serve the city, not the city serving the event. And this is, to me, very, very important and crucial because I think the old school was based on the city would do its utmost capacity to create or to host a, a, an interesting event within a week or maybe two weeks or one whole month, like the case of the FIFA. But I think the new philosophy should be no, it is not enough to do a wonderful job during the competition. The real challenge is how from the early beginnings to be fully aware how every single step you are doing for hosting the event has a, a positive future impact. So we started to consider what we called the, the legacy, the legacy pillars. One pillar was related to the stadiums, wonderful stadiums. One was designed by Zaha Hadid, another one designed by Norman Forster, one wonderful creative local architect, uh, Ibrahim Al Jida, designed Al Thomama Stadium also. But the idea here was once the competition is over, yes, some of the seats will be transported to uh, some other countries to help them to have uh, sports facilities. But more importantly, 
how each of those stadiums would be a catalyst for development within a specific urban context. So each of the stadiums were allocated in a place where the stadium will be a, a sort of an urban energy and you will inject a new urban energy within the context. And as you know, a lot of activity, a lot of stadiums now are, are around the world are not only designated for sports activities. You have concerts, you have uh, markets, you have bazaars. Even in Qatar, we do a lot of weddings in the outdoor and the stadiums can have a lot of ceremonies and weddings and so on. Another issue is related to urban transportation. And I talked that we want to move to transit-oriented development and we want to convince people in Qatar to abandon their cars. You cannot do that without creating state-of-the-art public transportation that would cover the whole metropolitan Doha and would take you all the way from the airport to the different main destinations that you want to go. Universities, entertainment, uh, residential areas, uh, schools, um, uh, uh, different museums, major hotels, major commercial uh, uh, centers, and so on. And as you can see here, literally state of the art, four lines covering the whole, uh, the whole area with excellent uh, um, uh, stations. Me, this is a key photo. Key photo in the sense that I know that those five guys here, all of them, they have Land Cruisers. Some of them, they are driving Porsches. But the fact that these guys, and I took this picture and I'm so proud of it, the fact, although the, all of them are doing WhatsApp or what have you, but uh, I mean, the fact that they are using the public transportation is suggesting a sort of I would say it's not evolution, it's a revolution to convince local people in Qatar to use the public transportation. This is what exactly would head us towards a more sustainable uh, uh, future. Uh, one one of, the, of the interesting also pillars where creativity was manifested is the notion of accommodation because you don't want to repeat the mistakes of uh, Brazil and South Africa and build a lot of hotels and after the tournament, no one would use it. You don't have the capacity. You don't have the, the number of uh, tours that would do that. So a lot of uh, new ideas, one of which is floating hotels, one of which is desert camps. And after the tournament, the, 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 the ships uh, traveled and the camps were dismantled and uh, no extra uh, money was uh, dedicated to this. We were thinking a lot about what people will do between matches, because Qatar is very small and it was it was very feasible to a lot of spectators to watch two or three matches. Actually, there's a there's a, a, a sports uh, a journalist. She was able to attend four matches in the same day believe it or not, because of the proximity of the spaces. But we were thinking a lot about what people would do in between those matches and how, again, as I talked about our philosophy, how to use this for the prosperity of the people and the local people and for the future. So we created the whole strategy for urban, open and green spaces integrated again with the network of walkable streets. And this strategy is a national strategy. It's covering the whole, uh, the whole uh, domain of Qatar and particularly focusing in Doha. And the main idea here is that we want to create a triumph for green and open spaces. We want people to go out. We want people to enjoy gardens. You cannot do that without moving again from the simple beautification to humanizations of roads and public spaces and literally creating spaces for people, particularly shaded areas, green areas, the scale, the more intimate and human scale, uh, bicycle routes and so on. Plenty of spaces that can uh, make, and, and, and we want to defy also the notion of people don't like to walk in the Gulf. They don't like to walk in the Gulf because as architects and urban designers, we were not able to create the appropriate places for them. But once we do that, people are enjoying walking. And they are enjoying walking because also we need to to celebrate the multicultural ethics and the, the, the boundaries and the different choices. 
all of the Gulf cities, including Qatar and including Doha, they have people coming from literally every single part of the world. I mean, Education City, where it, I, I teach and I, I showed you the project, we have people coming from 130 nationalities, working as professors, researchers, students, and so on and so forth. So cultural diversity here is important. It's an asset. And hence, you need to design places listening to the voice of all these people, not only a specific sector or the, the, the influential and the rich and what have you. Plenty, plenty of public spaces that are scattered around different parts of the city, the waterfront, the heart of the city, the heritage areas, all of them are prepared for people to enjoy without any kind of classifications or without any kind of money, nothing, no money to enter, no entry fee, no exclusivity. Public spaces are places for people. And you have different quality of public spaces. Some of them are kind of uh, community generated, they like the beautiful people doing salah in front of the baraha, the, 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 the public space in some of the traditional areas, or in the souk, or in the gardens, and so on. If you want to see the impact of this strategy and, and also see an evidence of the transformation that took place in Qatar, this piece of land in front of the Sheraton that I talked to you about, that is the one of the most important hotels and convention center and what have you, the, 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 the plan for using this plot of land was to create one more tower like this. I think it was, it will, it was designed to be similar to Burj Dubai or what have you. Now, because of the new philosophy, the new strategy, the new understanding of the meaning of the built environment and the future of Doha, uh, it, the, the whole project of the tower was cancelled, and this is the, the, the project now. This is the first part and the second part where people are having a wonderful time. This is part of the Museum of Islamic Park. Plenty of star architects also came to Doha, and also this is a very similar pattern uh, that we witness in all of the Gulf cities. They are hiring star architects. We want to bring people to star architects to our cities. I remember I had a discussion with Zaha Hadid when she told me I was amazed in Dubai. They took me in a plane and they said, we want you to select the piece of land that you want your project to be in. And she said, oh, well, but nobody told me about the project. They said, and they told her, it doesn't matter. You select the land and you do the project and you do whatever. We want Zaha Hadid in Dubai. You see what I'm saying? So, so hiring or inviting star architects to me was a manifestation of a total surrender for the Western experts and neglecting le the legitimacy of local dialogue, how to also be excited about the, the local knowledge. Let me show you some examples to manifest this. This is the National Library in Qatar designed by Rem Kulhas. And we had some interesting dialogues and interesting workshops, but the whole idea here was we are not a library goers or museum goers in the Gulf and in the Middle East. So we need a different quality of spaces. We need the library to give the impression that it's a public space rather than the typical dull image of the library, which is don't talk, don't smile, don't eat, don't drink, not, I don't know what. We want a people to walk and then the entrance as you can see here, will literally suck them into the place. And then when they enter the place, this is what they're gonna see. People are relaxing, having fun, drinking, eating, listening to music. And at the same time, books are scattered around them. The same exercise we did with the museum. This is the Museum of Islamic Art designed by IMK. But then again, because of the local, the local voice, we started to suggest the balance between the museum as a cultural place and the public space surrounding it and how this public space can be also injected by activities, pa park, bazaar, concerts, and so on and so forth. 
And now the place is so vibrant. And because of the public space and the park are so packed with people during the weekend, they go to the museum as a byproduct of their trip, which is very, very interesting. This is the Qatar National Museum. This is my hand in some of the workshops where we were basically talking about the importance of keeping the old palace. You know, some of the of the uh, star signature architects, when they go to Cantex in the Gulf, the very first thing they will do, even before the arrival of the architects, they will bulldoze everything. They have to give them a, a, a clean, what they call it, clean piece of land. In this, in this project, the local voice was crystallized to say to Novell, we have to keep the old palace because it's a representation of a specific chapter of the history of the city. And hence, your job as a creative architect is to do the marriage, is to respect and at the same time do the contradiction and to do this kind of dichotomy, architectural dichotomy. But at the same time, the relation between the project and the city is very organic. You can penetrate the project from every space and place. And you see the connection also with the waterfront. Even the boundaries are so blurred to the extent that you don't know if you are in and out, you are in a, a, a semi-public space, you are in a public space, you are in a private gallery. All of these boundaries are becoming so blurred to manifest the, the, the personality of the project as a cultural slash museum, cultural center slash museum, which is geared for the city rather than the cultured and the sophisticated. You see here the dichotomy that I'm talking about, the dialogue which is created between all the new past and present heritage and country. As, as you can see here in the picture, this uh, interesting uh, ascending between the old, the contemporary, and the waterfront and the Gulf. And even looking at heritage, we started also to preserve the heritage, but with the notion that heritage should be preserved for people to use rather than the negative preservation of restoration and you close the place. No, you do the, the, the conservation, preservation, but then inject it with life, create new uh, rehabilitation projects for people to use and enjoy. So to make a long story short, I want to uh, end up by saying that now we are working on Doha vision using all what we have learned and we have done, and we are moving dramatically towards people-centered architecture and urbanism, we want to keep on creating this balanced approach between uh, a, a resilient uh, future and, and, and relying on community participation. And when I say community here, I'm talking about everybody living rather than only locals. We acknowledge notions like smart and sustainable, but it must be just and resilient too. And the final point is that we need to preserve the national heritage and we learn from the past to guarantee a prosperous future. And thank you so much for having me. It was fun. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Professor Ali, for your... Uh... <clears throat> Um, I would say, I, I don't know how to explain, <clears throat> how to describe. It was, it was that bad? It was that bad? <laughs> Maybe not. Actually, like the way you uh, smoothly took us through the, um, the Gulf cities historically and also um, showing different phases and showing um, the impact of whatever um, historic context and historic activity, like in incidences. And I would say, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's good to to have all this in mind for for uh, um, for us as um, professionals and also for the younger generations to to learn from all the, those lessons. And I wonder, I mean, yeah, I, I would like to before I ask myself, I have a list of questions, of course, but I would prefer to uh, to give the floor to any of the audience. Um, Anybody has, yeah? I don't want to touch you. No, you have to come closer so he can. Wait. 
Hi, I have a question. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Alles gut. Alles gut. <laughs> Thank you so much for the very interesting lecture. Um, I have a question, but I don't know how well formulated it is. So um, if sure, you don't understand, sure. please let me know. Um, I thought it was everything super interesting and following your line of thought talking about the divification and the importance uh, for Doha to thrive to let go of this globalized urban model and stop trying to copy what happened in other places because it won't be the solution and then I was very fascinated about your mission impossible and when talking about the paradigm paradigm Paradigm. Thank you, paradigm of involving events in the city. Um, and I came to question, how can these two things combine? Because I'm Brazilian, so I went through all the complications of the World Cup that happened there at the time. And I saw the frustration and how badly managed it was and how badly developed it was. And I came, I, I found the division of the pillars extremely interesting as a matter of solutions and approaches of this, uh, of this massive transformation made for one event to be made for the whole urban sphere. And then I came to a question, maybe if the pillars should be implemented, not only after, the event is held, but since from the early uh, planning process, not something that happens, for example, in the case of Doha uh, after 2022, but something that already started in 2018. I don't know if that's clear. Now, uh, well, well, thank you so much for your, uh, for, for your introduction. And uh, Brazil is a beautiful country. I love Brazil so much. I mean, it's a uh, one of the countries where you know the meaning of life there, literally. People are so alive. Uh, but I don't know if you remember my slide where I had three photos and a big question mark related to 2050. And in this, in this slide, I was basically saying that since the moment of winning the bet for 20, hosting the FIFA 2022, we started to formulate the question of, we are not going to invest only for the event. We want to invest for the future. And this is why all these pillars, some of them started in 2011, in 2012. These pillars, I'm not talking about these pillars that are steps that we, we, we will start doing now. All of this started a year or two after uh, winning the bet. And therefore, when you talk about uh, public transportation, for instance, in 2019, uh, all the four lines of the metro were done all of them connecting the whole metropolitan city. So uh, I see your point, but I was trying, uh, maybe I was not that clear that all these pillars would, with the exception of the accommodation, of course, because the accommodation, the creative solutions, we did build some hotels, but uh, the creative solutions like the floating hotels and the desert camps and so on and so forth, all of this was the brainstorming uh, ideas that were generated maybe three or four years before the tournament. But all of this is the outcome of a decade of thinking, a, a whole 10 years of thinking. So those pillars, um, I would uh, rather ask, are, are they like um, documented in a certain like uh, uh, national policy or um, objectives? Uh, I don't know, strategies? Yeah. Even force up, up. Up. yeah. Absolutely, Dr. Hassan. Not only that, I mean, uh, to, to, to show you the, 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 the level of commitment, even the name of the committee that was uh, uh, organized. Yeah, the question, I mean, who was responsible for that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will elaborate on that in a minute. The, the, the main committee that was organized to supervise the whole process of hosting the FIFA, in the beginning, we called it the organizing the fifa organizing committee 
Two years afterwards, we changed the name to the FIFA Organizing and Legacy Committee. Now, the word legacy here became a key word from 2012, 2013, that, as I said, the new philosophy is not about hosting the event, is not how the, the event, the city serves the event, but the event is serving the city. And because of that, Dr. Hassan, we have a number of volumes. All of these volumes are suggesting the strategy of the legacy in different kind of domains, one of which is the built environment, the transportation, tourism, and so on and so forth. So all of this is very well documented. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's accessible that we can... Yeah, I can, I can send you everything. Yes, I mean, please. This would absolutely, be absolutely. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, and, and this committee, I mean, let me ask Baha this question because I think it's important in this phase to, to know it. Who are the members of the committee? I mean, who were, were represented? Sure, sure. Well, the... Well, the yeah, well, number one, in uh, and, and I'm sure you guys in some of your discussions, you, you talked about Gulf cities uh, and Gulf countries, and you know that all of the Gulf countries are ruled by families, right? So you have Al Sabah in Kuwait, you have Al Saud in Saudi Arabia, you have Al Thani in Qatar, you have Al Khalifa in Bahrain, and so on and so forth. So usually the Emir is very important in the decision-making process. But when it comes particularly to this uh, specific committee, the structure of the committee was so cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan in the sense that the leader was a young Qatari person, Hassan al-Dawadi, at that time he was 33 years old, amazing, amazing person very well educated and and he loves his country very committed to the, the the idea of how to make the event serving the future of qatar rather than only the event but then when you talk about the structure of the committee you name it because you have people related to hospitality you have people related to planning you have people related to architecture uh, uh, uh transportation security sports facilities. I mean, you know, this committee for at least the, the last five years was the most important committee in Qatar, whatever these guys would say. And I was part of it, of course, for specific uh, uh, issues related to urban development and project and the legacy concept and so on and so forth. But it was, in my opinion, it was so cosmopolitan and you have subcommittees. So between the main committee and the subcommittees, I would argue that the whole world was represented, literally, literally. Okay, great. Okay, you have another question from here and then we go to the questions that are online. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm um, Elnaz from Iran, and my question is uh, about Dubai, because... What, did you said what? What's your name? Elnaz. Anas from where? Iran. Iran. Oh, my goodness. I love Iran. <laughs> and I was in Iran two months ago. Oh, for real? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to Iran uh, about six or seven times. I love it. <laughs> So nice. Uh, okay, it, my question is about Dubai. I was there like, I think 25 years ago for the first time and there was nothing there. And after that, because it's near to Iran, so we could go there easily. Uh, I think like, I don't know, 10 years later, I was there again. And so it, it totally changed. And now my question is, uh, what happened to the heritage? What happened to the identity? And now I think there is no identity there. and you cannot understand where are you exactly. And, and my question is why, for example, we should have fake snow in Dubai. And there is a lot of opportunities that or potentials that we can use in this um, area. For example, um, there are a lot of great natures why we should make fake um, snow there. Yeah. yeah. 
but this is what exactly I was talking about in the lecture, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, I covered a lot of what you're asking for during the lecture, but let me elaborate on something interesting that you said. You said that 25 years ago, I went to, Iran, uh, to Dubai and there was nothing. I think this is exactly the problem, if you allow me. There were a lot of valuable things, but we were under the impression that we only look at what we feel is a manifestation of progress, development, and modernity. Because all the traditional parts of Dubai were still there. But everybody was suggesting that we need development which looks like the Western world. And therefore, Dubai resorted to imitating the West. This is what I was saying. But now I would have to say that now, not only in Dubai, even in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, definitely in Qatar, in Kuwait. In Kuwait, they destroyed the old part totally. Now they are coming back to respecting the heritage. And as you rightly said, the question of identity is becoming a very interesting question now. But the, the question of identity here not as a passive process, passive process in the sense that you would you would select a specific era in your history and you would say that this is the representation of my identity. Very similar to what we do in, in Egypt. Pharaohs, pharaohs, pharaohs. <clears throat> identity, in my opinion, is a very dynamic process. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, mentioning the heritage, I remember 2004, I was in Dubai and Sharjah. Back then, there was one, um, what do you call it? Tabia. Um, very small. Fort. Yeah, fort. Very small fort. 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 Yeah, it was reconstructed, actually. I mean, it was demolished some years before. And <coughs> back then, 2004, they recognized, right. well, that we have to reconstruct our um, heritage that we destroyed by ourselves. Yeah, and exactly. I think the Mshirab example that you have also uh, um, explained to us, I think uh, it has something to do with this. I don't know the scale. I mean, uh, you mentioned a lot of activities happening and going on, but I think it was expanded somehow based on a, on a, a core existing uh, heritage building. Is no, this is the core. No, Mshirab is the core. This is the core of the old city. Other extended parts are not related to the core. But the whole core, as I said in the lecture, the whole core was abandoned because, because people, after the oil boom, they have money. And they were, I mean, some architects would say that people would, and that this is not only for Qatar, all the Gulf cities, will come to their offices with pictures uh, of villas in, in Florida and California. And they would say, we want one of those. You see what I'm saying? But in the case of Mesherab, that was the core of the city, the old core. El Mesherab, the, the, the connection with the souk uh, and uh, the, the local community, the, the genesis of the traditional settlement of Doha was right in the heart of Mesherab. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is the one that we saw, see in your background, right? Yes, it's Souk Waqif, the ah. traditional market. Yes. Another case that also has been... Uh... This is this is cross, cross the street from Mesherab. They are so connected. This is the old part, and Mesherab is the, uh, the, 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 the new uh, uh, regenerative development. But Souq Waqif was intact. Okay. So let me go to the online in the chat. There is... Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali. This is from Mac. I see you. Thanks. Uh, Ahmed Debussy from Missouri University, thanks. No, okay, thank you for your amazing lecture. My question is, do Gulf cities face challenges in maintaining a dis distinct cultural identity that has been overshaded since the discovery of oil resulting in artificial urban development? Could a stranger emphasize, no, could a stronger emphasis on preserving and celebrating traditional architecture, incorporating sustainable design elements and utilizing vernacular building techniques have contributed to the creation. Yeah, I think this is also something that you have mentioned. Right. And actually, right. This, this takes me to the, yeah, maybe question from my side, the role of, uh, of Western or star architects, which has, mm -hmm. has changed somehow. You mentioned also how they were um, given the chance to do whatever. Huh? Mm -hmm. In other cases, 
they were asked or given like certain um, uh, task with the guidelines, we have to consider our own identity and our own conditions in the product. So I think this change of, of um, the relation between the client and the, 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 the architect is important to, to consider, right? I would, uh, I would rephrase this, Dr. Hassan, if you allow me. I would rephrase it in a sense that it's not about a relation between the architect and the client. It's, it's about respecting the local knowledge. It's about respecting that I am Renzo Piano or Rem Kuhus or Novell coming from a firm with the first uh, 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 class ticket reaching one of the Gulf cities. And then within two or three days, I will design for them. I think the confrontation that we were able to do with people like Rim Kulhas or Zaha Hadid or I am Pei or what have you, that you know what? You are a wonderful architect. You are extremely creative architect, but you don't know anything about us. You don't know anything about our culture. You don't know anything about our needs. You, remember when I talked to you, uh, when I said in the lecture about we are not a library goers. No architect would understand this. No architect coming from the West would understand that there's a city building a national library, but at the same time, the community people, they don't go to libraries. Sure. But therefore, I think what we were, we were able to do, uh, Dr. Hassan, particularly when it comes to star architects, is to convince those architects that there is value in listening to the local knowledge and the local voice. And because of that, I remember Rim Kulhas was telling me that uh, he gave a lecture at the uh, Canadian uh, Society of Architects, and he started the lecture with the library, of, uh, the library of Qatar, and he said, I have a specific vision about the library. I thought that I am one of the top designers of libraries in the world, but then I talked to the local people, and I changed the idea, and I changed the concept. And this is, I think, this is exactly what we need to do in the Middle East, in Turkey, in Iran, in Africa, in all of these places. We have to believe in the local knowledge. We have to believe that we have good architects, good brains, good designers, and we should not surrender to those big firms and star architects. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks a lot. Um, okay, we have two of our uh, valuable guests also raising their hands, Professor Ahmed al then Professor Al-Mu'taz. So Professor Ahmad Al-Khouli, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hassan. <clears throat> Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you, Ali. Professor Ali, uh, mesmerizing presentation as usual. I have three comments uh, that might add to what has been said and what and might open discussion on different issues. First, about the, the claim that oil uh, is not going to be, uh, I mean, it's not in the future. To tell you the truth, this is, I, I have doubts about it because still uh, research for uh, renewables and getting them to substitute oil and other fossil fuel uh, is not working yet. There is a movement towards greener, uh, cleaner sources of energy, but still uh, the, the cost, the prices, the acceptability, the applicability, all of that is there. For example, if you want to produce uh, those solar panels, uh, you need to raise the, the furnace to 1,200 degrees centigrade. You cannot do that with without oil. So when you bring your solar panels, you bring with them some kind of an environmental cost paid already up front, and you need the time for that solar panels to pay the debt to the environment. So this is my first uh, comment. My second comment is about uh, reclamation of uh, uh, the, the, the sea. It's not just because of doing projects like the ones in Dubai. Actually, 
uh, uh, it's one of the precautionary measures to avoid sea level rise because the level at the, the, the beach, the, the, the beach line at the coastline is almost equal to that of the sea. Now, if the sea level rise, then some areas of the cities will be inundated, will be submerged. So that's one of the recommendations is to raise uh, those coastlines a little bit. However, turning it into um, kind of yani, those projects that uh, like Jumeirah and stuff like this, I'm not sure it's doing the job. Uh, my third comment is about the, the knowledge-based urban development. Uh, in my opinion, it rests on human resources, the management of institutions. And if we look into uh, the latest uh, global uh, innovation index report, I collected five countries from the Middle East, uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Israel, in, in addition to Iran. Now, the rank of Israel is 16 worldwide. The four countries, Israel, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and UAE are classified as high income countries. But when we look into the position of Qatar, it's the uh, 52nd, Saudi Arabia 51st, uh, UAE 31st, and Iran, which is under embargo for years now, is 53rd. Now, this says something about the human resources, about the, the institutions capable of generating information. It's not just about the buildings, it's not just about how much they spent on that, and that brings me to and the point here within the third comment, it's about the, the issue of information availability and releasing such information for researchers to do their job. Uh, I've been, I've worked five years, seven years in the Gulf. I had, I mean, nightmares working with the authorities trying to do their, a project for them. They wouldn't release the data and the data is not complete, is not complete. So that affects your decision-making process. And last but not least, it's about the issue of human rights. Remember the fuss made about uh, Gulf countries, how much uh, the Asian labor have paid in lives and to, to build those marvelous buildings. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Ali can, Professor Ali, can you please um, comment back? Like the, no, the, that, these were three uh, comments. They were not questions. Comments, right, yeah. uh, Professor Ahmed? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Because there, there is a question also. I mean, it goes with the climate change uh, uh, point uh, from Dr. Kloss uh, um, regarding the, the construction, the huge construction that happened in Doha or. In Qatar in general, and how this was uh, environmentally considered, or were there any environmental um, uh, aspects uh, into consideration while doing this huge construction? This was a question mentioned. Yeah, sure. Well, in, in the old days, it was about building and building and building, because uh, in, in this Dubaification phase, it was only about building. Yes. And you are exporting materials from all over the place, and you are getting labor from all over the place. Now, part of the qualitative change that is happening now is that in Qatar, number one, we have the GSAS, which is the Gulf Sustainability uh, uh, Organization, and uh, they have standards that every single building is now is subjected to it. We have the Qatar Green Building Council also with a lot of criteria. We have classifications. So what I'm trying to say here is that we cannot evaluate Gulf cities and Gulf states like very well-established uh, countries, either in the West or even in the East, like Egypt or Algeria or Iraq or Syria, despite the political issues. But all of those countries, as I explained in my presentation, 
I mean, they started the modernization process 60, 70 years ago. So they were more geared towards building and developing and changing those cities. But now they have them, they are mature enough to introduce all of these uh, environmental concerns. And as I said, particularly in Qatar, I, I think in Dubai or Abu Dhabi also, they have something called Istidama, which is again, a sort of an evaluation procedure to examine the buildings and examining the impact and the environmental impact of uh, projects and buildings. And, and we have this in Qatar via the GSAS and, and, and uh, Qatar Green Building Council. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, we have also another, um, I don't know, question or comment from Professor Hermotez. Uh, thank you very much. I've been waiting for <laughs> almost an hour. <laughs> wow. uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali, for the presentation. It is really wonderful uh, one as usual, uh, something uh, I'm not really surprised. Uh, it, it is the, the same as usual, you know, so it is the same high performance. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank very you much, Professor. Hassan, for, and thank you very much, Hassan, for this opportunity uh, to have, you know, uh, despite the fact that we have it uh, at a short uh, notice, but uh, this is really great to, to be uh, around. Uh, my point here, uh, which I just want to raise uh, for, for, for this kind of, of, of comparative uh, presentation between uh, or the, the four cities or, or going through uh, Dubai, uh, Riyadh, uh, Sometimes we mentioned uh, some stuff about Cairo, and then coming to Doha is is about the the, the nature of the decision making process and who make the decision about the development. So if you look at all these paradigms, all these development is a top down nature. There's some sort of disjuncture between the ruling. Uh, authority or a ruling group who's really leading the country and between the people. People are always followers. The sense of the local communities, whether you're talking specifically, I can talk about two different experiences within uh, the development, for example, of the 2030 vision in Abu Dhabi, which I participated in, or being in Qatar for, for some time as well. And I'm sensing this between the, the, the locals and the students and uh, you can feel that you know they 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 are driven by these kind of developments, which is coming by or or, or imposed, let's say, by professionals and experts and the the, the 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 ruling group, but but not really embedded in the country. So the real issue of partnership and participation doesn't exist in the four examples, and this is or this brings all these kind of problems you've mentioned about the destruction of heritage in, in certain places, the uh, shift towards modernization, the, all these kind of issues, you know, is, 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 a, is, is the, there's some sort of, of lack of involvement of the local communities. So, so, so this, this juncture is a problem. Uh, people are not really engaged in the process. They are followers. Okay. And, 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 this is, and this is a major a challenge. Comment or a question? Because if it's a comment, we no, no, no. This is not a comment. I just want to have the feedback from Dr. Ali about this because the, the all all these examples they are wonderful, but they are still top down. They are not really embedded within the community. So okay. how you reflect on this? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Ali. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Al Mortaz. It's wonderful to see you and to have. Uh, your valuable insights. Now, uh, again, I want to put things in context. Um, I want to put things in context in the sense that very similar to my answer to the previous question, which is uh, we need to acknowledge that the whole development story that we are talking about, the whole modernization story narrative that we are talking about in the Gulf is within the last 60, 70 years. So when we talk about any concept like user participation and community participation, we need to understand that it's an evolution process. This is point number one. Point number two, which is fundamentally important, again, related to the context, we are talking about tribes. This is a tribal order, even before oil, all the people living in the Gulf are related to a specific tribes. And in the tribes, hierarchy is fundamentally important. 
it's part of the ethics, it's part of the respecting the elders, and also it's religious. Because when it comes to Islam also, Islam is talking about concepts like Imam, concepts like Khalifa, concepts like the, the head of the family, and so on and so forth. So the interesting thing here that you're talking about, sorry? And Surah concept as well. Exactly. This is the point, Dr. Hassan, that you're talking about a context where everything was used to be from top down because we have a trust in the head of the or the sheikh of the tribe or the imam in the mosque but now they are moving gradually towards that well of course when it comes to religious issues or what have you we listen to the imam and we listen to the sheikh but when it comes to designing places when it comes to designing what would happen in the street in front of me right. and uh, i think the process started with what they called it the majlis Majlis is a very informal kind of sitting within the Gulf. But now in the Urban Planning Authority, for instance, in Qatar, those people from the Majlis, they come and they have official meetings with the Urban Planning Authority to tell them that we had a meeting with uh, the local community and they want one, two, and three, and they reject the four, five, and six. So this is what I'm saying. I, I'm not saying that this is a rosy picture. I'm not saying that this is similar to what is happening in Berlin or Frankfurt or Hamburg. But what I'm saying is that we need to understand that there are signs of evolution. One of, and a final point regarding this, 20, 30 years ago, no one would acknowledge talking about expatriates in the Gulf. Yeah. the importance of creating places for expatriates because every single planner would come with how i can serve saudis how i can serve qataris how i can serve emiratis now because the all of these cities they realized that our model is a global slash cosmopolitan slash creative model we need to bring people from all over the world and no one would come to you unless you respect his spatial needs, architectural needs, and urban needs. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, but I just want to, to have a little comment, if you don't mind, about, about this point specifically about consultation. So, so what I meant here by my comment is that the dialogue and the understanding within the local community of the, these kind of shifts doesn't exist. The communication between the, 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 the local authority and the, 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 the strategy, whether we are talking about all the, 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 the four, uh, four uh, cities, you know, uh, there's some sort of deficiencies here. People do not understand why we are doing this. This is what I meant by they are always followers. So, so this is the, the, the critical point is that you are not part of the story. So this is the point. Thanks. When you say, I don't want to go into a dialogue because I, I know Dr. Hassan has a short time. <laughs> okay. uh, but when you say, Dr. Mortez, that uh, you're not part of this. Are you talking about the decision makers? Or are you talking about the local community? I'm talking about the local community. They are not part of the story. But I just said that the local community now is having official meetings at the Urban Planning Authority to say this is what we need. So how come they are not part of the story? Yeah, Dr. Ali, this is this is not about the strategy and the policy. They are just discussing. This kind of discussion goes for, for small little things. They are still looking about their needs and demands. But how I'm going to move in the future, this is totally, totally different from just well, urgent needs about about decision about, uh, about you know having a let's, let's agree let's agree that i mean in the whole region participation is relatively like not compared to um uh, the west let's say and when it comes this is to, fine this is absolutely fine yes i mean uh, but starting this i would say this is a good sign that um mm -hmm. Probably, as Professor Ali mentioned, that this is this is a new actually um, thing that people are not used to, um, yeah. to, to be considered. Uh, to, uh, yeah, we can go for arguments, and I can give you examples about this. So, so there is no point, you know, of discussion. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. Just, just I have, you know, lots of examples. You know, I, I know about about how participation happened and how they set back. You know, so this is the this is the point: is that the 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 
whatever we are talking about development, whatever we are talking about knowledge-based planning, still the locals are not developed enough to really be part of the story. So this is this is this is the dilemma here: is that you are driving the development very fast, but the local community doesn't really appreciate, doesn't have the chance to grasp this and develop in parallel. So the product would be really of, of, of a problem because. I've got a community at a certain level of development, and at the same time, the thinking and what's going on is is really far beyond belief. So, so how we are gonna make this kind of you know or, or fill this kind of gap between the locals in order to make them able or enable the local community to effectively participate and become creative? This is my point. Okay. Let, let, let me let me say an example. I mean, from from the city where we're talking from. I mean, Berlin. Yeah? I mean. Participation is there. People are asked to participate and to give their to meet, uh, like attend meetings and give their opinions, and they don't participate. Sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they don't attend. Um, the thing is that it is institutionalized. I would say this might be the way, if participation and community, um, uh, let's say, um, listening to the community needs, being institutionalized then and only then this would be guaranteed that their voices would be heard if it's not institutionalized which is actually of course a developed step to have it inside the whole process that no decisions can be taken without listening and approval of i don't know how many yeah so this kind of institutionalization if it's not yet there it's still valid point that it started even uh, I mean, first it, it started um, in some places, it happens informally, in some places it happens like it's documented, but mm, uh, I would say not necessary that the decision makers listen to all what is uh, mentioned. So the dialogue is not yet mature. Maybe also the, the pace of development is too fast and the communication channels is not yet, I mean, I'm not talking about particular country, by the way, now I'm talking about different um, uh, context they have the similar conditions but we have um yeah i think we have to stop the discussion oh, please, fine, yeah. ending because there is a, a, a professor waiting the dean is waiting for for me oh, for the room. oh my goodness i don't want to be in the blacklist no no <laughs> <laughs> the dean is here okay so okay. Uh, thank you thanks thank you so much thank you thank you uh, thanks a lot Cheers. Um, thanks, Professor Ali. Thanks, the audience, and see you soon in another meeting. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you for having me.